Well, good morning. good morning. Wow, it's so nice to, uh, to be here. Nice to be with you and nice to see you. And we're thankful that you're here. And here we are, uh, 2018, is it, right? <laughs> and we're studying a passage that takes place in Damascus. And uh, interestingly enough, that's where the bombs were falling this last week. Isn't that amazing? That some 2,000, almost 2,000 years later, here we are reading about the same place. The Lord works in mysterious ways, surely. And before I begin, let me just, um, in this passage that was read, that's what we're going to look at, and I think there's some food here for each one of us to uh, munch on and to become a part of our thinking and our attitude and relationship to God and to glory and what He is doing and has done in the past and on our behalf, I might add. But let me also just say, I hope you'll stay for the uh, potluck in the back. I have found that to be really good for eating purposes. Um, people bring their, their good dishes, and uh, boy, it's always a sweet time to, to do that, and it's also a, a, a great time to fellowship, get to know one another a little better, see what's going on in your life. And my life's pretty dull, but, uh, you know, I'll share it with you. And we can, uh, we can visit and encourage one another, and I... I hope that uh, you will stay for that. And then please consider coming Friday night. I can't imagine a better topic to deal with, more appropriate for the times in which we live. And uh, David Platt is a, is a gifted man. Uh, he can uh, talk three times faster than most of us can think. And, uh, and he's very scripturally bound. And it will be an enriching time. And you don't have to stay until 12 or 1 o'clock if you don't want to, even though the last time we had it, I know Lynn Jolly back there was still here at about 1 o'clock. And so uh, in case you're wondering, he's a 90-plus now, so if he can handle it, you ought to be able to handle it, right? I told myself that. So, uh, But it is an enriching time, but you know, can come and go if you want. It's a good time as well for fellowship. There are breaks, even though those things seem to go rather rapidly because it's like getting uh, fed from a fire hose. Uh, there's a little book that you get and you get to follow along in that book and take that home with you. And anyway, it's a, it's a very enjoyable and precious time as any time is that we are in the Word of God. So that was a non-paid announcement, okay? But we encourage you to come six o'clock on Friday. Now, with that, let's turn our attention to this precious Word of God, and we'll be studying in chapter 9, verses 10 through 19. This is a narrative, but it is the Word of God, something that has happened and very important something and something that can enrich us today that has been penned by Luke on our behalf. So, let's... Uh, ask the Lord again to bless our time together, please. Father, we beseech you for your presence today. We have your precious word. We are so thankful for it. And we pray that you'd help us, Father, by your spirit to use this word in a way that is accurate, to guide us in your truth, Father, and to be able to take that and and into ourselves and drink of it, and that it might change us and help us to know you, help us to know you better, know your ways, and what you are doing, and recognize that all of history, including our own personal little history, is all in your hands. Help us to be encouraged by that. You're always in control, and we pray your oversight, your blessing today, with each one of us and that you'd give us ears to hear and that you'd use this time to glorify your son, our Lord Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Okay, the focus from this narrative is really, I think, for us on what we can learn from it. Uh, and one of the things that that to me is, is very clear here, at least you have two basic characters in this writing. 
you have Saul of Tarsus, but you also have Ananias, this man that we that comes on this scene and we don't hear of him again. Well, Paul will talk about him later in the book of Acts. He will bring his name up and we'll look there. But, but he, he appears and then he's gone, but he plays a very significant role. And, and what we think of in terms of that is the concept, at least I do, of waiting on the Lord. Now you say, what does what waiting has to do with having faith? We're really in our lives, in what we're doing today. And every day we should have a mindset, an attitude of waiting upon the Lord. I think that is seen in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, where Peter talks about the greatest, I think, concept of evangelism is to sanctify Jesus Christ in our heart and always being ready to give an account to everyone who asks us the reason of the hope within us with fear and trembling. Always being ready to be of service, in other words, to the Lord. And His work through us is why we're here. We're here to be lights. We're here to be salt. We also have the concept of God choosing in His providence to do that which we could never think of. <laughs> the absolute unexpected, the, the most bizarre things in the world because as 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 says, God has chosen the foolish to shame the wise and the weak to shame the strong. So, here we have Saul of Tarsus, nobody. In fact, in our reading, he would be the last man on earth to be considered as useful to God or chosen of God to evangelize the then world and write the majority of the New Testament. Saul, the zealous persecutor of the church, would become Paul, the evangelist and apostle, to build Christ's church. Who could imagine such a thing? I, I tried to think in my little brain that who could I think of that would be the most obnoxious person to be used of God in our day and time to, uh, and I, you know, I thought of, uh, forgive me if I'm hurting your feelings, but I thought of Chuck Schumer. You know, I said, well, you know, he is a Jew, <laughs> but, but, you know, that, that really doesn't fit. Or how about... Um, Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the PLO. Well, that doesn't really fit either. But the point of the concept is that here is God working in a way that nobody could ever imagine or predict. And also in this totally unpredictable work is this man named Ananias. We know only a little of him. He appears only in this narrative and one other about the same event but he's simply here shown to be and I say simply because that's not simple that is very special but he's just a faithful follower of Jesus Christ used of God at this particular point in his life to bless Saul and therefore to bless the church of the living God the most important thing that's going on then and down through the ages to our age. So the first thing we're going to look at here, how does God work through this man that we only know of as Ananias, except for what the scripture tells us? If you look at verse 10 of chapter 9, it says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. That little wor uh, word in the Greek now suggests continuity or continuance with the previous paragraph. And, of course, the previous paragraph tells us of Saul, who was nearing Damascus with official papers to seize, persecute, lock up. And he even discloses later, when he's talking to one of the kings, to kill Christians. But, but, big but. Christ overwhelms him on the road and speaks to him. And instead of him going uh, in his pride and arrogance and 
thinking uh, he's really got a handle on things, he comes into Damascus humbled and blind. And then we're introduced to Ananias. And that's where the then comes in, called a disciple, a follower, that's all that means, of the Lord. He's not a, an apostle. He has no claim for that. Uh, but later, when Paul makes his defense before the Jews, we find some additional information. Look with me, hold a finger there, and go over to Acts 22, and look at verse 12. <clears throat> Here is Paul's defense before the Jews, and he says, A certain Ananias, a man who was devout by the standard of the law, and well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing near said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And that, at that very time, I looked upon him. So here is this one that is said to be devout. And that's a Greek word, ulabas, u meaning good, and labas, to lay hold of. And in other words, the idea is that good has laid hold of him, or he has laid hold of good, a union there together. And the idea is he has a hold or a serious relationship with God. We looked this morning at some text in the Old Testament that had to do with individuals that were called righteous. And I think this is a, a similar phrase that would be used that this Ananias was a righteous man, not in his own righteousness, but he was a man that had a relationship with God. And it says he is well spoken of. And that means that he bore a testimony before others. And so here is a man that is obviously living his faith. He's a new believer in Jesus Christ, and he is known to be a believer in Jesus Christ. That's just that simple. And he's a man, therefore, that God uses in this special way to minister to Saul. And, of course, looking back on that, what a glorious privilege. And his name is pinned in the Word of God for all eternity. Just a steadfast or faithful man to God and living in such a way, as we said, as waiting on God to use him in any manner God chooses. And that should be what each of us are doing. We should be waiting on God to use us in any manner that he chooses. That's what we're here for. We're not here for these other silly reasons that many are preaching out of pulpits about today that are all focused on self-interest May I remind you that the Westminster Confession got this right, that the chief end of man is to what? Glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And we can't enjoy Him if we're not glorifying Him in our lives and what we're doing. We are here. We are here, if you're in Christ, to be used of God. And I pray that God will give us a continual, steadfast mindset to be ready any ways we can be used of God as His instrument to benefit others, to know Christ, to serve others, to witness before others, so that Christ will be seen in us. It's God that does the work. And He was doing the work here through Ananias, and Ananias wasn't expecting this. He was just a faithful servant, and God used him. And you also notice here, back in our text, in verse 11, the Lord said to him, get up and go to the street, call, excuse me, he says, now there's a disciple named D D at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. There is implied here, at least uh, in this statement, just sort of uh, an amazing, strongly, uh, closely intimate relationship for we see that there's almost this uh, comfort that Ananias has. It, he wasn't terrified you know, by any kind of indication here of God speaking, or this is Jesus Christ, we believe, speaking to him. Uh, 
And we see this also carried into verse 11, where it says, And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight. Again, the Lord says, it says, The Lord said to him, I repeat from verse 10, And even though this is a time of signs and wonders, a, a time of transition that we've talked about before, a transition of miracles God used in the early going, because that's what this book is about in the history of, of building his church, it was a transition to establish Christ's church and to mark out that this work of Jesus Christ, the, the wonderful things that he did while on the earth that were supernatural, are continuing for a time into the early history of the church. Now, we don't know how God spoke in this vision. I guess it really doesn't matter, but he did. And I remind you again to, that today we have the completed canon. They didn't have that. All they had was the Old Testament scripture at this time. And we are privileged to have all this finished, perfect work that we can constantly study to show ourselves approved. And if we're not doing that, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. And not only to study to show ourselves approved, but we need ed edification. We need food. And this is good food here. This is wonderful food. Praise God that we have that. And I trust that you're taking every advantage of that. Now, he puts things today also upon our heart. I don't have any doubt about that. I know he's put things on my heart. I haven't personally been privileged to see Christ appear before me. <laughs> or speak to me in a dream, I'm not even going to say that he doesn't directly do that to men. I can't rule that out entirely in this day. I don't believe he adds to Scripture. But what I do know, he did in this time, and here he shows this idea of Ananias being either asleep, perhaps praying, or, or in some sense of a trance, but it was a real trance when he says, get up, would indicate that he was sleeping or praying or on his face or whatever. Maybe he was like John in, in Revelation chapter 1. <laughs> when he saw the vision, he fell down on his face. I, I don't know. But at any rate, it was clear and it was real. And then God gives explicit instructions he says in verse 11 go to the street called straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul for he is praying this address I have studied is a real address that was known at that time a real street of course and it was known as a prominent residence that was obvious that Judas person here, and this is certainly not the Judas that we think of in the scripture, it's just another man by that name, but he was obviously a Jew, and here is Saul of Tarsus coming in to the city with papers, and this prominent Jew was probably or likely going to accept him into his home anyway, of course he didn't expect to encounter what he's going to encounter with this humbled, beaten up, beaten down, uh, man, Saul of Tarsus, that was so dynamic, and he's not dynamic now, coming into his residence. And so we get to verse 12, and he said, he has seen in a vision, talking to Ananias, a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. He here is this amazing, all these activities are being directed perfectly by God. He calls a bird of prey from the east. He puts together and knits together everything. The hairs on our heads are numbered. And he's putting together the details of our life. That's why we can truly say from the heart, and because it's truth, that he works all things together for good to them that love him. And here he is putting the pieces together. He's preparing the way. He prepares the way for you and me. When we talk about 
well, I don't know what to do, or I'm concerned, or I'm anxious about my circumstances. Is there anything that's got the Lord God off guard, or he's not aware of, or if he's not closing this door, he's not opening this door over here, et cetera, et cetera. All of that is true, and that is seen very carefully here. We, we, we are looking at this at the highest level, yes. And he says here in verse 12, that this, here's this man, Ananias, come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. All the road is prepared. Saul will be expecting you, and you will be my instrument to restore his vision, to regain his sight. Per se, he's going to be the instrument that God will use. The first Christian that Saul has encountered that he hadn't tried to whip up on or destroy or certainly bind up and haul off to prison. And this one's going to be used to regain his sight and commission him. Now you think about what an odd transition all of this is. How abrupt and unusual, something only God can do. And now even this, it sounds simple enough, but not so. I would remind you that God most often calls people to do just, not just something difficult or something irrational not something what we would think of as impractical but really something impossible <laughs> here's God talking to Ananias and the reputation of Saul is everywhere he's the most obnoxious man that anybody could ever imagine he's the last guy on earth than Ananias or any Christian wants to encounter unless they're looking for the lion's den or something else. And so we have an objection from Ananias, understandably so, when we get to verse 13. He says, but Ananias answered. There's one of those buts again <laughs> that are so important in Scripture. Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. Uh, what he's heard, how much harm. And here he's coming, he says, uh, with the authority, verse 14, from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. He's coming with papers. He's coming purposefully. He's not just here on vacation or something or just uh, uh, sort of be at ease of, or something else. He is coming here specifically for the purpose of persecution of God's people. And so Ananias would be walking into the lion's den, per se. Now, like Ananias, we are often guilty of thinking in our grumbling and daily complaining, even about the smallest things, whether it's the weather or something else going on, that God doesn't know what he's doing here. We, we, we don't say that. We wouldn't say that probably, but that's what we're really saying by how we go about things and our attitude because when things seem to make no sense, we sort of take the attitude that, well, maybe the Lord kind of slipped up on this one or, or he hasn't, this is not important to him or, or something else. This is the very last person that Ananias would want to contact. But of course, he doesn't know what God is doing yet. At least he hasn't had a full dose of instruction and he's about to receive it. Job didn't know what God was doing in his ugly, ugly situation and his wretched state. And interestingly enough, God never told him either. And Ananias, though, is blessed by God's answer to him because he tells him specifically. And a lot of, but a lot of times we don't know, do we? And that's what faith is all about. Faith is believing in who he is and trusting him entirely no matter what my circumstance, my current situation. That has to do again with this whole business of overcoming the world. Now, what will God tell him? The Lord said to him, 
go. Well, that's a simple word there, isn't it? Go. And sometimes that's just what we need to do. Get going in, in the name of Christ in whatever we're doing. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. Ananias would not have any imagination to know what God would do through Saul of Tarsus. How could he? How could anybody imagine such a thing? And looking back to imagine at the same time Ananias, the blessing that he becomes in just this simple act that he does by here embracing this persecutor, Saul, by God's grace, he would make him the most significant apostle, if there is such a thing, they all had their place, to God's elect, the great apostle, Somebody I look forward to meeting and be in his presence in the kingdom of God. And if this is all that Ananias ever did, wow, how significant is that? And I couldn't help but think uh, in my little walk with the Lord, if, if I in some sense, and you in some sense, have affected just one person in our life, if we've just done one thing in obedience to God, to be helpful that someone might have known Jesus Christ or been built up in the most holy faith and strengthened and encouraged in Him, one little act, that gives me some bearing upon why I'm here and what is my existence all about. This word instrument here that is used, he is a chosen instrument, eskuros, is elsewhere translated vessel or jar. And that's really all that any of us are. We're just vessels or, or, or jars to be used for his glory. Let's go to a couple of passages. Just keep your finger here and go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This was Paul speaking. And uh, look at chapter 4, verse 1. He says, Let a man regard us in this manner. He's talking about us, us being Christians, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Is that your attitude? <clears throat> servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Well, you say, well, I'm not the Apostle Paul, but he says, let us. He's talking to any Christian the reason God has left us here to do His will and commanded us to do that is to be exactly what He says here. Look over a few more pages at chapter 6. Look at verse 19 and 20. And He's talking here, of course, about eating food that had been offered to a false god. But He's, but he's making this declaration do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and, and you're not your own? We're not our own. That's why uh, Paul would say that he was a bond slave of Jesus Christ. It, we're not our own. We belong to him. We are here to do his will. He says in verse 20, For you've been bought with a price. Therefore, back to the Westminster Confession, glorify God in your body. Have we ever lost that concept in today's Christianity that is so focused upon me and my needs and my aspirations and so much of that is just a facade. It's just ridiculous. That's what the world is focused on. That's why Christ uh, preached in the 
Sermon on the Mount. To, to, don't worry about what you eat and what you drink and what you put on. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. All these things will be added to you, and they will be. Oh, oh we got a kingdom to come. Oh, oh. But right now, we're supposed to be fighting the good fight of faith. We are to die to self and live for him. That's what the scripture teaches. It's not about us. It's about him. Now back in our text, in fact, he elaborates on this, and I think for good reason. Look at verse 16. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. That seems like an odd thing to put in there, doesn't it? <laughs> I thought he was having his best life now. <laughs> well, I, that's what I've been taught. Haven't you been taught that? I believe John MacArthur's right when he says, if you're unsaved, this is your best life now. Believe me, the next one's not going to be very attractive at all. But you see, that has the wrong focus, doesn't it? Because our focus is to serve Him. And that's why He brings this up. This is an amazing disclosure from God. Saul, who is causing all this suffering to Christ via His body, who is the church, will now suffer Himself for Christ to set before us the example of what we need to be willing to do for Christ. That's it. That's it in a nutshell. In fact, keep your finger here again. Let's go over this time to 2 Corinthians. Uh, look at chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul was put in a position to have to defend himself against this foolish Corinthian church. And thankfully... He does because he tells us in so many ways what the Christian life is really all about in service to God. Notice how he defends himself. 2 Corinthians 11, look at verse 22. He's describing himself because these have said, you know, I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos and I'm of Christ and I'm of somebody else. He says, are, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I more so in far more labors and far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. By the way, each time that occurred, the person was, was the expression of that was to put a person to the very threshold the very point of death that's no small thing this is no hand slap three times I was beaten with rods once I was stoned three times I was shipwrecked a night and day I've spent in the deep I've been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers dangers from robbers dangers from my countrymen dangers from the Gentiles dangers in the city dangers in the wilderness dangers on the sea dangers among false brethren I am having my best life now Oh, excuse me, I didn't see that. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of the concern for all the churches. Wow. So you think you have troubles, okay? Okay. Was God involved in all of this? Oh, yes. Amen. Look at, look at, uh, maybe it's just across your page. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 14 and 15. Here for this third time, I'm ready to come to you, and I will not be a burden to you, for I do not seek what is yours. Paul had no hidden agenda, but you, I'm seeking you. For children are not responsible to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. I will, but I will most gladly spend and be expended for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? 
Paul was expressing in all that he did his love for God and his love for the elect. He tells us elsewhere that he does all of these things that those of God might come to know him. Look back at 1 Corinthians, since we're in the Corinthians again, chapter 11. Look at verse 1. Because this gets right up in our face, as he was in the Corinthians. When we study all these things, what does he say? Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Now, no, nobody else could ever say such a thing. And I, I, this, is, this is really an amazing statement that God chose the Apostle Paul as somebody to emulate to take his life and his writing because why? Because he became the God-given example of what it means to be a Christian. And the reason for that is, is that he followed the pattern, the message, the truth, the example of Jesus Christ himself to the fullest. So therefore, we can follow his example. Now, I don't expect to be the Apostle Paul. That's not what I'm saying. But if you would... Pardon me for a minute about the army's slogan. He's saying, you want to be all you can be? <laughs> now we're talking about in the name of Christ. Then follow my example. Be all you can be in the name of Christ in your service while you're on the earth. And our, our role or purpose here is not to lead a trouble-free life. That may surprise some. Uh, I remember I used to have a silly slogan when I was very foolish and I, in college that I would tell other people and they'd ask me various and sundry. My slogan was, I want to get through the day with the least amount of hassle. Get through the day with the least amount of hassle. Well, you know, I can't really say that anymore. Now, I don't like hassle, don't get me wrong. But that's not my purpose. My purpose is to serve Jesus Christ, whatever hassle that means. That's what Paul was talking about. Ananias had to go through a hassle here to go talk to, with I would think even to some degree it doesn't show it in the passage with some fear and trembling to this one who's persecuting Christians and confront him because God told him to and he's trusting God. I remind you in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, not getting you to turn there, but all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's probably one of the most difficult passages in the New Testament. Something that, you know, we don't really focus a lot on, but, you know, it, it, it's real. But, of course, we have to take that into account with the words of Jesus Christ when he said, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all manner of evil against you because of me. And he doesn't stop there, just blessed. Well, okay, well, Lord, what does that mean? Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. <laughs> this is all about trusting him. In the world, you'll have tribulation. But we're not walk by sight, but by faith in him. I will get you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, we often go here uh, for funerals. And we're talking about a man or woman of God that has departed, and it certainly is real for that. But I think it's very real for the living today. 2 Timothy 4, look at verse 7. Here's Paul knowing that he is about to have his head removed. And what does he say? I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. 
Now we're looking at the initiation of Paul into the ministry, and here he is. Now we're looking at the end of Paul in that ministry. We're seeing the beginning, and now we're looking at the end. And what is the issue that is of significance? I have fought the good fight. I finished the course. I kept the faith. That is what is significant to me and you. If you're in Christ Jesus. And he goes on to say, In the future there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. This is for all who love his appearing. And you'll not love his appearing, frankly, if you're not living for him. You're going to be scared to death at his appearing. Or the, even the idea of it. That's, you know, way off out there somewhere. Well, I don't know about that. I know he's coming again. He's going to bring his church to himself. And the issue is my readiness on a daily basis, my fighting the good fight of faith. That's what I'm here for. And just as Ananias was inconvenienced, and so was the Apostle Paul, or Saul of Tarsus became the Apostle Paul, inconvenienced. I mean, his life was turned upside down. None could be blessed more than those who submit to God's will and serve Him no matter the cost. I can assure you, and I assure myself of this, any little old thing that we do, and I know that we're not saved by our works, that's not what I'm talking about, but anything we do in the name of Christ with the right attitude, and God measures our attitude too, is the most significant thing that we could be doing. And you're not ever going to stand in, in the day of, of judgment before Christ for the rewards that he gives out to his saints and say, gee, I just wish I hadn't spent my time doing that. How silly. How foolish. We need the mind of Jesus Christ. Back to our text. He says, so verse 17 says, and so here all of this is supplied by Ananias. He says, so Ananias departed and entered the house. And there's no hesitation following the Lord's replies as to what he was doing. Ananias believed him. Ananias, by faith, got up. It says he entered the house, not likely a friendly house. But he obeys. And notice how he greets him here. Brother Saul. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? Can you imagine thinking in those terms? Uh, that's like the PLO leader, Hamas, you know, leader. Uh, Mahmoud, uh, whatever his name is. Brother so-and-so. Well, this was real. Brother Saul. They had never met. They had, if they had met three days before, he certainly wouldn't have been calling him Brother Saul. In fact, he would have been bound for prison by this one, but here he has the confidence of the instruction that he has received from the Lord, the same kind of confidence we ought to have today in his word where we receive instruction. Look again, holding your finger here at Acts 22, where Paul recites this same account and gives further detail in verses 14 to 16 where he says and he said the, the God of our fathers has appointed you this is the words of Ananias has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one that's Jesus Christ and to hear an utterance from his mouth for you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard now why do you delay get up be baptized Wash away your sins, calling on his name. Now, the washing away of sins there doesn't mean that the physical baptism does that. He's talking about it's a picture. It's what God you know, has told us to do in obedience to him, to give that outward show, this ordinance, to display the fact 
that I am a different man. I'm a new creation in Jesus Christ. And if there's ever a new creation, boy, this one is about as obvious as you can possibly get. Be identified, in other words, with Jesus Christ. We cannot be Paul. But we can be obedient to Jesus Christ in our own little realm and do what is pleasing to him. Now here, the, the Apostle Paul, or Saul of Tarsus now, he says, it Regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, the Spirit of God had already been working in him, for back in verse 11, what was he doing? He says, when, he's ta- when Christ was talking to Ananias, he says, For he is praying. For he is praying. This quote I put in the bulletin, a little simple quote from Spurgeon, which is really not simple, it's profound. But prayer is the autograph of the Holy Ghost on the renewed heart. Now don't let the Holy Ghost, that's the way they talked back in those days, Holy Spirit, on the renewed heart. Now, we're talking here about genuine prayer, not the pharisaical prayer that Saul of Tarsus would have been praying back in Luke 18, like the Pharisee was. I thank you that I'm not like that other man over there, sinners and you know, whatever. He is a man who con- uh, con- has a contrite heart, a man that is convicted, a man that has, his whole world has been disturbed and turned upside down through this revelation that he had of Jesus Christ has dealt a blow to him for all eternity. And so that major change was already present. But may I remind you in this transition work, the Holy Spirit was not at first given as it wasn't at Pentecost. It is today. But this was a transition time. And so it was not necessarily given at conversion, But now it will fill him up to equip to be the faithful apostle that he will become. Because it's not Paul, as smart as he was, as dynamic as he was. It's the work of God through him. And he will repeatedly say that. Now back to our text. We find this commissioning where he is, Saul is made ready. We've already seen that back in verse 11, he's been grappling with God in prayer, and there's no greater preparation than this. It is essential. And Paul will become, of course, a great prayer warrior, such that he will say in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. Because it was recognized that this is the Everything that a Christian does is the power of God working through them, not their own strength. We don't get up in the morning and, and uh, uh, start pumping ourselves up like we would lift weights and uh, so forth. We go to God. Lord, have mercy. Help me today. Keep the evil one for me today. Help me to serve you. Help me to be faithful to you. I hope you're doing that. I hope you're doing that. You'll notice back in our text it says in verse 18 immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he regained his sight and he got up and was baptized. Immediately. His physical condition here radically changes and but more importantly is the spiritual change that it is exemplifying by the physical change. This is to me like the hymn Amazing Grace, where John Newton says, I once was blind, but now I see. The idea that he could now see physically this man, Ananias, this simple, humble follower of Jesus Christ, and see him differently than he would have seen him three days before. 
see him through the eyes of love. And he's baptized in obedience to Christ. And now a believer and follower of the Lord Jesus. We don't have any details of that. But that must have been a peculiar thing going on there in this uh, Jewish house where he had come there with papers to persecute the Christians and all of a sudden now he's joining them and becoming one of them. <laughs> all of this is just the most peculiar, amazing thing. And of course, then we read further that, you know, they're going to seek to kill this Saul of Tarsus in just a short time and they have to let him off the, over the wall of Damascus in a basket <laughs> to get him out of there without him being murdered by these same Jews. Here is this transformation. And Ananias is part of it. And you and I, as children of God, are part of the transformation that comes from those who are walking in darkness and then they see the light. I want to, in closing, remind us of this by going to Philippians 3 where Paul is reiterating this radical change in him from being a uh, religious man of the highest order reminding us that just being in church today just being religious today just uh, trying to do the best we can and all that kind of stuff according to somebody's Rules that they may have even extracted from God's Word as though it's a how-to book and it's not. Not in that sense anyway. But what does the Apostle say? Philippians 3, he's talking about the change that overcame, overcame him. We can't look at this exhaustively at all, but look at verse 7. He says, Whatever things were gained to me, and what were those things? Incredible religious credentials. Incredible. Nobody had better credentials. But that wasn't anything. These things that were gained to me, those things I've counted lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in viewing of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. And you know that word rubbish is refuse, it's dung. That's how ugly, by comparison, that is to knowing in reality and real knowledge, real relationship by faith, knowing Jesus Christ. Oh, how necessary to have this transforming faith and life in Jesus Christ. In Philippians 3, 9, he says, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, as good as that might appear, but that which is through faith in Christ and the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, faith that has no merit, but a faith that shows the transformation of heart that must be real. And every child of God that makes all the difference the same kind of faith that Ananias had to do what was pleasing to God, what he commanded him to do, the difficult thing to go and talk to this persecutor just believing God. And that's the same kind of faith we need today to do his will. I'm going to read a quote by MacArthur on this passage when he was dealing with it in his commentary. He says, The Spirit transformed Saul in two fundamental ways. First, he took Saul's natural strengths and refined them. Saul was a gifted natural leader with strong willpower. He was a man of strong convictions, a self-starter, bold, a master of using his time and talents, a motivated individual and a profoundly gifted thinker and speaker, he transformed all of that to use it 
in the name of Christ. And he says the Holy Spirit also eliminated undesirable characteristics and replaced them with desirable ones. He replaced Saul's cruel hatred with love. His restless, aggressive spirit with peace. His rough, hard-nosed treatment of people with gentleness. His pride with humility. Only the Spirit of God can so thoroughly sanctify a life. I agree 100%. My friend, can you equate, at least in some part, with what this is saying? Sanctification is that process that we should all be in if we're as followers of Christ that makes us more like Christ. And really, that's what this is all about. Saul of Tarsus, who becomes Paul the Apostle, as an imitator of Jesus Christ, by the power of God, is someone we can emulate only because he begins to become like Christ. And even there, he's not perfect because he says that in Philippians 3, if we read on. He says, I have not attained, but I press on. And that's what we're doing today. If you're in Jesus Christ, we're pressing on. Has God invaded your life so that you have faith, the kind of faith that sees self-righteous behavior as trash, and you cling only to Christ? Here's the invitation. Christ offers himself. Repeatedly he offers himself. You know, I think of Isaiah 55. Come to the fountain. You don't have to buy anything. You don't have to pay anything. Why will you not come? He is the fountain. He is the hope. He is everything. Come to Him. Turn it over to Him. That's what Ananias even in that small way had to do when he got up and obeyed Christ. That's what we have to do. Trust Him. Love Him. Seek to know Him. And serve Him. And in that sense, you'll be waiting on the Lord. Who knows what He will do through you. If you live for him, abide with him on a daily basis. Let me pray, please. Father, we thank you for this narrative of a real circumstance, a real history, dear Lord. Oh, we thank you that you save individuals. And we thank you for the salvation that you gave to Saul of Tarsus that he might become the, the wonderful apostle and write the things that he's written that we may know of thee, Father, that we may understand how we praise you for your wonderful ways. Please bless this day. Bless the heart and mind of every listener. Oh, guide them to service to thee. First, trust in you. And conviction and commitment to live for you. And then, Father, Fill them with your spirit and guide them in your truth that all here in the sound of my voice might live for you to the glory of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.